Hello, this is uh, Kristen Gotzi with the AK-47 podcast, 47 Works of Alexander Kolontai, and I am here today with my daughter, Christiana. Hello. And she's going to ask me a series of questions about who Alexander Kolontai was and why we should care about her. Well, I guess I'll just start off with asking, who was Alexander Kolontai and why should we care about her? So... Alexander Kolontai was this feminist, well, kind of a proto-feminist, really. She would not have called herself a feminist because she hated feminists pretty severely. Uh, she was a socialist who thought that the only way that women could be truly free was by instituting socialism. She had some pretty radical ideas about the family and very specifically about freeing women from the burden, what she considered the burden of marriage and motherhood and dependency on men. So she actually started writing at a very early age about this idea that women should be economically independent of men, and that meant they needed to get educated, and that meant they needed to have their own jobs and their own incomes. And only when they had their own incomes would they be able to kind of, you know, find self-fulfillment. Well, in that case, now that I know who she is, I'm a little confused as to why she's relevant today because it sounds like a lot of her philosophies and her thoughts and opinions are very referential to the early 20th century Russian climate in which socialism was on the rise and women were not liberated from men, whereas nowadays we're much more modern and feminism is obviously much more common and women are educated and more or less economically independent from men. So why would you say that... Uh, this podcast is even necessary. Why are her ideas relevant now? That's a, that's a good question. So I think there are a couple of things. The first thing is, is I don't think women are as economically independent as they think they are, particularly after they have children. Once you have children, trying to balance work and family is really hard for a lot of women in the United States where we don't have any kind of mandatory paid maternity leave or parental leave and where we don't have uh, a subsidized uh, childcare available for people to leave their kids. Childcare, in fact, is quite expensive um, and it's inaccessible. So a lot of women have to stay home. Even if they want to continue working, they have no choice if they have children but to stay home because they can't afford childcare or they can't find good childcare. So that's the first thing. But the second thing that I think is really interesting is that Alexander Kolontai was a little bit of a sex radical. And she actually had some pretty strong ideas about the ways that capitalism sort of forced women to commodify their sexuality, commodify themselves in order to pay their rent, essentially. Like the only way you could um, survive as a woman was by selling yourself into a marriage relationship. Um, or, you know, basically you became a commodity in some way, and traded from fathers to husbands. And she deeply understood that relationships that were based on transaction, uh, or she argued, I think, that relationships that were based on some kind of transactional ethos where a man is getting access to a woman's sexuality, but also her reproductive capacity in exchange for him paying her rent and giving her food and buying her clothes and all the things that she needs in order to survive, uh, that those kinds of relationships are not as authentic and pure in terms of love and the quality of relationships as relationships where there are two individuals who really actually just kind of like each other and find each other kind of attractive and they hook up and they're together because they love each other and not because one of them is paying the rent for the other. So the reason that I think that that particular issue is relevant in 2019, like over 100 years after she was writing about it, is because we're still sort of dealing with the problem of the commodification of our relationships. Well, I definitely think that there might be somewhat of a, a rift between Alexandra Kolontai's ex own experiences with women being forced into marriage and the interaction via social media or Tinder or all of these apps that allow people to meet each other. How can we relate her perspectives on the marriage aspect of women's lives and being tethered to... Uh, being tethered to men, as you say, in after childbirth or after uh, the commodification and the enslavement sort of of women in the home, how is that relevant to young people today who aren't even thinking about settling down in a relationship beyond having a fling and hooking up with people because you like them? Right. And that's, that's exactly the crux of it, right? So what she is arguing in some of her earlier works 
is that relationships that are built on a transactional ethos, right? Where you get into a relationship because you're basically not just sort of hooking up and liking each other and hanging out, you're actually expecting to get something out of the relationship. The reason that I think it's relevant in, in 2019 to the this question of the quote unquote gamification, that, that word is not my word, by the way, that comes from that Atlantic article about the sex recession that, you know, Tinder has gamified dating. That's, that's a quote from that article. Um, the thing that's really interesting is that when you do something and you don't expect to get something out of it, it's not a transaction, you treat that thing very differently than when you're doing something because you're expecting to get paid. So a really good example of this was I was I gave a book talk um, at a bookstore in Narberth in December. And there was a woman who was listening to me and she had this kind of epiphany. And she said, I love fencing. Fencing was like her absolute passion. And so she loved fencing so much that she decided to open her own fencing studio to provide a space for people in the area to fence, to go and fence, right? It's like a very kind of aristocratic sort of sport, but it's something that people are really passionate about, fencing. And what she said, and she said it was really interesting that she thought that by opening this studio, she would be following, doing something that she loved and and, and really, you know, uh, creating this wonderful space for other people. And it was an incredible space for other people. So much of their worlds, their sociality was around this fencing studio that she'd created. The problem was that her interaction with every person in the studio had to do with getting them to pay to access the studio. And she said that slowly because it was now a job, because it was now a transactional relationship, her own passion for fencing ended up kind of falling by the wayside. So you could say, this sounds a lot like a lot of my friends at school, in my high school. We talk a lot about how much fun learning is and how much in, how interesting it is to watch video essays on YouTube talking about the philosophical arguments behind various TV shows that we like. And we would really be excited to learn about this and then as soon as we take a psychology class or a philosophy class, it suddenly becomes boring and tiresome and cumbersome in a way because that learning in a different way is very commodified because we have to, rather than just learning for the sake of it, we have to get good grades and we have to pass exams. And we, we know that every single movement that we make and every single thing that we do while we learn is for the purpose of getting a job later or getting into the right college or getting the good grades. So it's it's very much stacked in goals and it's not truly a, a experience between the learning and the human in the same way as it is when it's not commodified. Right, it's a transaction, right? You know that you have to do well in this class in order to get this grade, in order to get into that college, in order to get that job, in order to have this life, in order to buy the house and whatever, 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 right? It's all kind of part of this transactional package. And what I think is really interesting, what Colin Ty writes about quite a lot actually, is this idea that if you could free relationships from economic, from transact the transactional ethos, right, that existed. And of course, in her time, it was really about, you know, women having no other choice but to find husbands if they wanted to um, support themselves. I mean, especially because, of course, her, she was herself an aristocrat, so she was looking largely at women of her own class. Uh, later, she started uh, writing about, you know, working class women um, who were forced into destitution um, because of their working conditions. So, uh, so she had a kind of expansive theory, but she was really talking about destroying the family. Um, and not like destroying it in this kind of like scary conservative way, but like reimagining the family so that the family was not just an economic unit that quote unquote enslaved women, but a place of love and happiness and support. The thing about apps, right? Like when you hang out with your friends, you guys are just hanging out. But when you're hanging out on Facebook or if you're hanging out on Google Chat or you're hanging out on Tinder, 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 Tinder <laughs> um, your relationship is being mediated by a for-profit corporation, right? So that app or that website or that social media platform is actually commodifying your relationship for their own purposes. And when you're sitting like with your friend and hanging out and like 
talking or playing cards against humanity or I don't know, whatever you do, um, eating at Mido or something like that relationship is not being commodified in quite the same way. I disagree. You disagree? Because every time kids my age, every time, the, the examples that you just used, when we're playing Cards Against Humanity, somebody bought the deck of cards, somebody gave money to a for-profit organization to buy this thing that will entertain us. Right. When we, when we go to Mido, the restaurant in our neighborhood, we are buying food that goes mm-hmm. to the for-profit restaurant right. organization. Whereas through social media, the transaction is more subtle and it's not explicitly paying money. Right. Because we don't think of it that way because what we are doing is free for us, but our information is being sold for revenue and for a for-profit organization. So it's much more subtle in a way on the internet, which is why a lot of people seem f- sort of freaked out about it. A lot of people don't really care because of its subtlety. And a lot of people think, well, it doesn't tell you what price it's getting from you. It doesn't tell you yeah. why you why it even exists. It seems ostensibly to be there for your own benefit. But in fact, there is an organization behind it that's making tons of profits off of your information and your conversation and your interaction with other people. So... I think the problem with the transactionality of social media isn't necessarily with the money or the revenue that is being created by interacting via social media, but perhaps with the transaction of likes for posts or comments. Oftentimes we see follow for follow or like for like, where people treat likes or approval on social media as... Uh, a way of paying others and they expect payment in return. So it's very transactional in a more subtle way that is not as glaringly obvious, but it's so inherent in the culture that a lot of people don't really look at it as transactional mm. and a lot of people don't really care about it. And it's But if you post something on social media, let's say you put up a Instagram post or you post something on Facebook, right? Or you tweet something. And you see how many people like it or retweet it or give you the thumbs up or whatever. Does it make you feel bad when you post something that doesn't get followed? Of course. Why? Because when there's a... Especially when somebody puts... Posts something. For example, there's there's a... um, I'm in the theater company at at my school. And when... We have a show. There are often a lot of pictures because of events during and after the show. And every time all these pictures happen, everybody posts their pictures of them with other people. And they talk about how much they love the company and they love the show. And everybody likes and comments on each other's posts. And so especially when that happens and you see that you post something and somebody else, another friend, will post something very similar and they get more likes or they get more comments from specific people than you do, it makes you feel bad because it makes you feel less important. And so the the transact the, the sort of the reputation of you as a person is determined by how many people will type meaningless comments on your pictures. <laughs> which seems silly. But it is so psychologically embedded in our culture nowadays that it's definitely a a unique problem. And it's interesting to look back at philosophies such as Colin Ties because obviously she was dealing with much very different problems. She was dealing with forced marriage and a, a society in which you really can't do anything other than what's socially prescribed. Whereas now... It's not that you can't do anything, it's that you feel worthless if you don't. So in in some ways it's much more insidious than on the surface just being forced to live a lifestyle that you don't necessarily want because you have to or you'll be socially disgraced. Mm -hmm. Whereas when put in that context, social disgrace is kind of the consequence for both situations. So I I guess... So it's not that different. It's not that different. Uh, I... I guess. So it's not such a bad idea to read Colin Tai. No, actually, it's not. 
I would like to hear more. Yeah, so maybe she just needs like an Instagram account or something like that. I think I think that definitely drawing parallels between Colin Ty's beliefs and her circumstances, which seem utterly alien to us nowadays, looking at them and seeing that maybe they actually aren't that different after all, and seeing how our relationships and our interactions via social media, which is nothing that Colin Ty had ever even dreamed of at the time, are actually not that different. Right. And that there's a way in which some of the, the things that she's writing about, about the, the kind of purity of human relationships, and of course she's not only talking about romantic relationships, she talks a lot about romantic relationships, but she talks also about comradely love, which is friendship. Um, she thinks that friendship... What a socialist term. Yes, <laughs> definitely, comradely love. So so anyway, uh, this has been a fun first conversation. Awesome. And uh, so I now... I agree. Yeah, I think we should do I feel like more. I've really worked something through. Yeah. In my you know, philo- philosophy. Your philosophy, yes. Uh, yeah, thanks. Well, thank you yeah. for and talking I, with me. I hope you will agree to come back on been my show. A lovely interlocutor. <laughs> okay. That was really...